Go ahead, Rosh. Thank you, Petra. Hello, everybody. A very warm welcome to the second day of the Tech and Digital Virtual Fair with and by refugees. My name is Raj Berman, Chief Executive of Tech Fugees. I'd like to thank our partner, Turn, for co-hosting this two-day event. We are my sincere thanks to go to all the amazing speakers that we've lined up today, and also including those who presented yesterday, together with our partners and our sponsors. But most of all, all the innovators and entrepreneurs and everyone who's joining us today, because today is really your day. For those of us who are joining us for the first time today, um, we've actually covered the theme of refugee entrepreneurship, where we heard yesterday several incredible initiatives taken by UK entrepreneurs and refugees, together with Glo Global Displaced in launching their digital businesses, including Google's keynote presentation on the importance of digital skills and tools that are available at hand to support. But today, the real theme for today is all about responsible innovations empowering displaced inclusion. We are recording the session today, so you will have the ability to watch the recording of the presentations, including those from yesterday. But before I go on to talk about the agenda, a little bit of housekeeping. We are using Zoom today, and, and today is all about engaging and making connections and your participation. So please use the Zoom chat to ask questions and comments as much as you can. We encourage you all to use all the links and, and that are shared over the chat. There is also an event page on LinkedIn too, where you can also connect and network to. Now, if you do experience any internet dropout during the session, you can actually rejoin the session using the same link that was sent. But if you are experiencing any particular technical issues or difficulties, my colleague Petra Johansson is actually available on chat who's able to assist you. So today's agenda is really all at, it framed in two parts. Um, the first of all, we're going to introduce my welcome speech by Mike Butcher, who's the co-founder and chairman of Tech Fugees Foundation, and also the editor of Large at TechCrunch, followed by myself and our partner, Fred Krasner, at, uh, we'll introduce our partnership. And very privileged and honored to have Ahmed Sufyan Bayran, who's going to be delivering a keynote speech from Techstars. We then follow on to the second part of the agenda, which is all about responsible innovations, where together we're with a range of great thought leaders and initiatives from the globe, we are going to orchestrate 30 minute sessions around education and work and responsible innovations around health. And then we finally wrap up with a presentation around a particular on online sort of repository tool, which we have called Base Fugees, which will do a demonstration. But the real thrust of the day is an like innovation call to action. And we'll share that survey uh, during, th during the chat today. So with that, I'd love to welcome and very privileged to honor uh, to bring in Mike Butcher, who is our co-founder and chairman of Tech Futures Foundation. Mike has actually got a range of accolades uh, in the industry. Uh, he's the editor of large at TechCrunch. Um, he's well-renowned journalist and he's participated in many digital thought initiatives. He works very closely with government and I'm very humbled and honored to, to have Mike welcome this uh, presentation. Thank you. Over to you, Mike. I'll stop sharing my Thanks very much, Raj. Um, I'm not sure if I'm live or not, but uh, I appreciate. Looks like I, looks like I'm about to go live or something. Um, You're okay. live. Thanks very much. Well, I appreciate that, Raj. That's really very kind, generous uh, introduction. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, everyone, thank you so much for coming uh, and attending this uh, Tech Fugees and Turn event this week. Uh, it's fantastic to see you. I'm absolutely over the moon that this has been put together. It's been an incredible, fantastic event. And I'm really, in, really uh, excited to be working with Turn on this uh, initiative. Uh, and uh, thanks to everyone who's, who's put it in place. Um, now, for, for day two, the, the theme of this day is responsible innovations, empowering displaced inclusion. And, uh, and obviously, you'll be able to check out the program. Um, and I thought perhaps if uh, I just put some context on, on, on my role, I suppose, and what I, where I think uh, Tech for G's is, is going and, and where the team uh, has been working on its next iteration. 
So just to sort of give you a little bit of a background, first of all, I'm in London. We're locked down in London, terribly boring. I've got a lockdown haircut. Um, <laughs> and, uh, uh, but you know, what, what the hell? I'm much better off than, than anybody else out there, especially a displaced person. Um, so this is a breeze compared to what they have to go through. That's, uh, and that's certainly something that we've always got to remember, keeping the back of our heads. Now, obviously, in you know, I set up Tech Fugees back in the day in 2015. I'm just a, a normal technology journalist who, uh, you know, who wanted to get involved. And um, I, um, I was walking along on, along one day, and I just thought, refugees, tech, tech fu, tech fu, tech fugees. I thought so, and I, because I thought that really, in order in order for these big problems to be tackled, we needed the kinds of things that happen in the tech world. We needed design thinking, we needed products, we needed connectivity, we needed also, and we also needed creativity that the technology industry can bring. Um, and so I just threw up this whole idea, put, put up a Facebook page which I, and group, which I, everyone is probably pretty familiar with now, and sent it to 50 of my friends on a Sunday night. And, and on the Monday morning, I had 100, 100 people. And then on the Tuesday, there were 300 people. And on the Wednesday, there was uh, 1,000 people. And it just went on and on from there. And quite clearly, there was a huge desire by people in the technology industry to get involved uh, with the issues of refugees and displaced people. Um, and you know, my inbox exploded. And then uh, in the next few uh, weeks and months, we had uh, the first our initial conference uh, 200 people turned up for that. We had investors, venture capitalists came to a conference about refugees. And we also, and then we did a hackathon. Josephine Goob was at that first hackathon. And we did another event as well after that. So it was a huge, huge outpouring of, of a desire to get involved uh, in this issue by, by te technology people and, and the industry. And, and also, I, I don't know if anyone can see the chat, um, but uh, in the following year, at the beginning of 2016, I, um, we did a, uh, a, uh, a YouTube uh, kind of thing for eight hours. So for eight hours, I sat on YouTube, boring everybody. Well, not boring everybody. We started in Australia and we ended up with, um, with, with people who were doing initiatives in Australia, in Asia, then in Europe, and then we finally ended in California um, amongst the technology industry engaging with this issue. So it was a fantastic uh, outpouring of, of uh, lo well, love, because we wanted, we wanted to get involved in this issue. So, and from there, obviously, out of that minimum viable product, we created um, a, a steering board and thankfully Josephine Goob took up, took up the mantle of becoming uh, our first CEO in that role. And from the very first uh, initial idea, we wanted to promote the idea of, of taking the principle, a lot of the ideas behind the technology world and applying them to these issues. So we used design thinking uh, around that as well and product design and all of those kinds of things. And Josephine did a fantastic uh, job running the ball, expanding our community and programs around the world. And, uh, you know, fast forward uh, to the present day, and we've, I'm really delighted that Raj Berman has joined us last year to look at our global strategy and to put together a whole, uh, a whole range of ideas and directions and strategies for TechFugees going forward. So thank you, Bharat Raj, for that. So with our guiding principles, which is something that we've really, really worked on very, very hard on as, as, as a team and as a group, um, the whole idea being to work with displaced peoples has helped TechFugees define guiding principles for responsible innovation. We've had, we've had to remember that the whole idea of TechFugees was to bring the idea of information into the refugee response, because the only way to deal with the sheer scale of the issue was to produce scalable solutions. And that meant tech and innovation and product led ideas. And these guiding principles based on years of running hackathons and open innovation events in 25 countries uh, are extremely important. And obviously they're all on our website and I won't run through them all now, but you'll, you'll hear about them during today. But these principles enable us to work towards supporting tech, tech for refugees projects built, built for and by, importantly, displaced people within the framework of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations. And they assert our strong belief that technology can have a long-term positive impact on refugees and displaced people only if they are guided by a set of ethical principles and values. 
So these guiding principles are here to guide our collective action towards a shared goal to create technology that empowers displaced people around the world. And we also need to remember that going forward in the next few, few years, in the next decades, in fact, uh, the, the issues of displaced people will be coming from all angles, uh, uh, and especially due to climate change, which is something that are going to be a big focus for us in the, in the next year and year, years to come, I'm sure. So in the future, TechFugees is moving from its historic role of being in the tech for good space, a sort of a MVP, if you will, minimum viable product that is tech centric towards tech for all. So MVP in the sense of most valuable solutions to displaced persons for responsible innovations. And that's why, where we want to go from here on. And it means that the whole, whole world needs, uh, is something that tech for gs wants to be involved in. Well, anyway, uh, that's enough, enough from me. Um, and I'm sure you're gonna have a great day with some great content and networking and um, some uh, fantastic uh, connections to be made. Um, and thanks very much from me, Mike. And I'm gonna hand that over back to uh, Raj at TechVGs and Fred at Turn to wrap up uh, and highlight our partnership. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Uh, it's a pleasure. So let's move on to TechVGs. It's great to see how we've grown as an organization over the last five years. Uh, but let me, let me uh, share some context and to the importance as to why we're all here, you know, um, one of the stats I, I shared yesterday was that around 9 million people on the planet uh, is the latest figure, the annual figure, uh, who are actually displaced. You know, that's one person for every four seconds being displaced somewhere, uh, 24,000 people in a day, and it's rapidly rising. You know, the current UNHCR reports that roughly about 80 million people, that's 1% of humanity, are actually displaced. And last September, uh, a globally renowned Australian think tank uh, did some forecasting, which is the Institute of Economics and Peace, projected 1.2 billion people are going to be projected as climate migrants uh, due to global warming by 2050. So at TechFugees, you know, our global community of 56,000 uh, followers is continuing to grow um, and broad as wide uh, with people and organizations who are coming together under a, as a digital collective with, to serve one common cause. And that common cause is all about promoting the human rights of displaced people through responsible di digital innovations and supporting their inclusion in digital society. Now, during the course of today, you're gonna hear some amazing insights, uh, particularly the grassroots stories of how the TechFugees team are working together with displaced people on the ground to curate responsible digital innovation solutions that actually make a difference for those communities to get access to information, education, health, work, and inclusion. Whilst also leveraging the open data digital tools and platforms that we've, in, we've developed to kind of imp empower their inclusion. So with that, you know, innovations and entrepreneurship go hand in hand. That's a given. There are two sides of the same coin that actually make a difference. So TechFugees and TURN we actually found natural synergies in the work that we naturally do, respectively do between us in the areas of innovations and entrepreneurship to empower UK refugees and the globally displaced. So we're absolutely thrilled to partner with TURN and for, to bring you this event uh, with an exciting program and with incredible keynotes that we're gonna have in speakers. So with that, I'm gonna ask Fred at TURN to tell you a little bit more about the TURN and the relationship that we've got together. Over you to you, Fred. Thank you, Raj. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, everyone, for making this happen. And wonderful to see you to the audience. Thanks for being with us today. I'll tell you just very briefly about TURN, just as Raj did about tech Fugees. So our vision is a world where refugees have a fair chance to build their own livelihoods and to enable them to thrive through the power of their own ideas. So that's something we really have in common. And it is really our work to grow startup ecosystems and marketplaces that help entrepreneurs with refugee status reach out to the world, get their businesses and nonprofits started to grow and sustain them. So it's also about community and it's great to have Dalil here and uh, Afnan and hopefully now as well to actually um, engage with you and tell you more about their ideas and 
um, yeah, have a great panel with you guys. In terms of our growth plan, we have a goal to reach 4,000 people by 2025 across the UK, Canada, and US especially, but also in other places, and to help 2,000 of them to start their own sustainable business or nonprofit. And it's something we want to do together with our community and also together with Tech Fugees. And Raj and I will tell you now um, what our synergy and our partnership can bring to the world. Indeed. So we're sharing our excitement here. So from a Tech Fugees perspective, you know, the theme of the day is obviously, as I said, responsible innovations that promote the rights of displaced persons. So one of the call to actions you will hear later on during today, uh, one of my colleagues is going to be presenting the innovation survey. Perhaps we can put that on the link right now um, on the chat. That will that'll help give you a bit more insight. But we're actually thrilled to, to be in partnership with, with TURN. Uh, you know, this day is all about connecting with you. Uh, is to find new ways of how we can support the community of tech and digital founders and also the entrepreneurs who are actually working and curating digital innovations together with other organizations on the ground to actually come together as a, as a collective to help people. Um, we are obviously looking for lots of support between us uh, as an organization. We are working collectively as partners. So we're looking for in-kind support, marketing support, ex volunteers, funding, you name it. Um, anything that you guys can help us will make such a big difference. Um, so with that, maybe I can hand over to Fred to tell you his perspective of, of the relationship too. Thank you, Raj. And it's really wonderful to have this partnership because I also think it's bringing together and fusing two communities and understanding and exploring what that could mean and how we can really leverage the potential of both communities to aid each other in their endeavors to make change in these responsible innovation areas that you're going to talk about today. I think um, already tech fiji strength and the community that you've built globally is incredible at bringing people together. Turn wouldn't exist without uh, tech fiji's because we met, uh, our co-founder team met at a tech fiji event in 2015. So here we are five years later in a partnership. I couldn't even have imagined that uh, five years ago. Um, I think that's a sign of what you guys can do. You bring people together from all backgrounds and you help them collaborate, uh, explore their synergies and you are great at channeling their innovations. We as TURN normally work with people as they have an idea and then help them make their ideas real and turn them into businesses, into nonprofits, help them grow and sustain and even just launch the ideas in the first place. So I think bringing these two things together, you bringing a community of innovators together from all backgrounds and us supporting those people towards the realization of their ideas into something that reaches out to communities on scale is something that is exciting for the community. I think the resources that you mentioned that we hope to channel, we want to channel to the people who have those ideas. Um, and that means all the support you want to bring to us as partners, whoever you are, they can be channeled to entrepreneurs and innovators with displaced backgrounds or them and their collaborators. So that's what it's all about. Um, I'm excited about the results of the survey that uh, Petra has just sent through that Raj had already announced uh, because this will be your ideas coming through for us to have visibility and to get in touch with you and support you as you then turn them real and hopefully we can help you uh, make those things a reality. So I really appreciate this partnership and what it can do. This is just the beginning. And thanks everybody for being here with us to actually experience this and get it kicked off. I really appreciate you and enjoy the panels. Thank, thank you, Fred, indeed. So indeed today is, is marks a new beginning as it were of curating our networks together in the tech and digital space. We're so, so excited uh, by the relationship. So please do reach out to Tech Fugees and TURN. Uh, we'd love to work with you. Ha do have a look at the innovation survey and, and reach out to us at Connect to us. So with that, I'd love to introduce our first uh, keynote uh, speaker. It's very honored to invite Ahmed Bayram, who is the regional manager of uh, Techstars in EMEA. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing individual with an, he's written so many in, uh, areas of uh, books and on entrepreneurship. He's he, and around uh, the refugee community. This is a key advocate in this space. So with that, I'd love to invite Ahmed to the stage to take the floor uh, and I'll stop sharing my screen so he can present himself. Thank you, Ahmed. Well, thanks to you. Thank you so much, Raj. Thanks for Tech Fishies and Charan uh, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. I'm gonna share my screen uh, as well to share. 
present some slides and some pictures for you. Um, I trust that you can see it. Uh, Considerably enough, so um, my name is Ahmad, I'm the region manager for Techstars uh, in Middle East and Africa and recently Europe, uh, so probably I'm doing a good job, uh, and also been tech VGs uh, for the past um, five years. Uh, so yesterday, Facebook reminded me that it's been like five years since I joined, and a year after year, I cannot be more proud enough to be part of this community uh, to be able to help bringing technologies um, to global refugees. What bring me here um, is it was not uh, like straightforward journey. It was like ups, uh, ups and down. In 2010, I started a group of friends and I started a business that we call it um, Joymaker, which was like a customized gift website that we created in my hometown in Damascus in Syria. Sadly, shortly after the, the country went into war um, and, and, and we start to face a lot of challenge. Back then, we launched a couple of products in the market. We received our investment, um, our first uh, seed, uh, pre-seed and seed investment. Uh, we got some promising product in the market that the customers loved us, but we cannot be able to sustain, mainly because the country went into the war, which is technically, I guess, you're all familiar with. So uh, Joymaker was called by the war makers, and there was no more joy to sell in the country. Where we didn't do anything wrong in the business, um, we just like the market to change, the people change around us, and we we lost uh, the many factories that we used to uh, produce our product in. Every time we had to meet, we used to call each other and to see if it's safe for us to meet uh, before we uh, we just go to the office uh, and have a regular meetings uh, to conduct our business. Our investors has to flee the country, uh, just among many other investors, more than sixty percent of. Uh, Syrian local investors, they had to leave the country. So we lost our source of income from the customers and the possibility to pivot from our investors. Uh, all of that um, get me into um, with no support ecosystem. So accelerator programs, they had to close. Um, investors left, venture capital, there was not existing incubations, all the relied on one uh, operate, incubation operating, uh, that's all for you an office, but with a lot of electricity cut off where XIT used to cut off more than it's in. So uh, we, we left with no supportive ecosystem. And I took an initiative later afterwards uh, to start to build uh, this supportive ecosystem, believing that entrepreneurship is not about having a great idea rather than it's having the uh, the supportive ecosystem that can help individual uh, build up their dreams and create their own uh, their own business. Uh, so I took the initiative and I took um, to to build a startup ecosystems um, in my country Syria and for Syrian diaspora uh, by visiting more than twenty countries uh, where the Syrian majority are, conducting meetings, uh, business school camps, uh, competitions. Uh, just individual networking and events where we get the chance to see and discuss and we talk about ourselves. Uh, the jury took me to the US, uh, multiple places in Europe, uh, Sudan, even to Malaysia, where some Syrians also like uh, going there um, uh, to, to, to do other business and work. Sadly, shortly after the COVID-19 hit, and the hit of COVID-19 was more as much as it was difficult for us, uh, and in Europe, it was more severe uh, for the for the Middle East and even more severe for the community uh, of refugees, where the majority of refugees living in the conditions where healthcare uh, or uh, clean water um, or very much uh, density communities is really crowded. Uh, so it's very hard for them to take any measurements. Uh, the, the facts of staying home and have lockdown uh, and a quarantine is very much difficult because they rely on their source of income uh, and a daily income to, to feed their family. Any day of uh, any day for them not working, that means um, a less income and less food on the table uh, for their family. I've recently conducting studies that are investigating uh, the COVID-19 impact of the Syrian refugees, which is going to be out in a partnership which is soon on Spark next week. Uh, one of the started finding that 87% of the people said they have negatively impacted, and 43% uh, of them they have the in, they explain the impact of COVID-19 on their businesses to be extreme. Uh, the study uh, focused uh, on Turkey, Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon, and interviewed more than 230 uh, active businesses, uh, more than 150 of those businesses they had to close either temporarily or permanently because of the COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19. So I would like to take uh, this opportunity as well uh, here today to discuss like what are the, fain, uh, the, the main five factors uh, that's impacting the Syrian um, refugees entrepreneurs uh, with their businesses due to the COVID-19. And if we're discussing that digitalization will be the new norm, uh, and this is a lot of stuff that will be online 
to refugees that also have the means and resources in order to, to go that. For many of the people uh, that we met and, and talked to, uh, funding sources is very much um, a challenge for them to sustain. A lot of entrepreneurs who are starting uh, their businesses, they either rely on saving and bootstrapping or friends and family to put together some fund, kick off their products, create a prototype uh, before they start maybe sell some product for their business and approach VCs. But sadly, you know, because of refugees, they left with no resources. Uh, also, their family and friends, they don't have any uh, means in order to support them. They left uh, by themselves in order to sustain their business uh, internally. So they will be keep the little saving they have in order to be the business. That means the times uh, that's led them to launch their products on average be like nine months uh, because they don't have a lot of time and they need to find another resources of incomes where other people might go to obtain some loans. Um, refugees are denied from banking activities because they don't have any assets. Uh, they could put it to approach some loans. Many of them, they also try to approach venture capitals, but unfortunately that was like also uh, hard for them because they don't have a record of success. They don't have a networks or connections that helping with. So this is, was one of the main struggles uh, for them so that helps them maybe rely on organizations um, just like TechVG's, Turns, or other uh, international organizations to be able to access the fundings. But due to the COVID-19, many of those organizations that work is underground with the refugees, they shifted their priority from entrepreneurship or capacity building programs to due to the humanitarian and prioritize uh, health and humanitarian response. So those businesses almost denied of any services. The second, the most uh, top of challenge that was among uh, the, the, the refugees was like more of uh, laws and regulations. Uh, there's a still a lot of fake in terms of refugees be able to access the work, especially if we talk about Middle East or Sub-Saharan African countries, uh, where sadly uh, it's not a lot for many people to work. Um, it's in some countries, refugees, they have to sign a pledge for no work uh, or they only allow to work in specific sectors. Uh, online or like a freelancing or creating startups, could be something vague. They don't know if they are allowed to work uh, or not. So that's causing uh, the problems of registering, registering the company, be able to do a partnership, be able to work with the people or digitalize their work. So if they get the license approved to work offline, that means they have to go through the hustle back again. That takes a lot of permits, approval, understanding of taxations, et cetera, in order to go and apply again uh, to go to the offline. Third, it was the infrastructure, um, where we all now hosting this event online. Sadly, a lot of the majority of, uh, of refugees, they don't have access to internet uh, or electricity or access to those will cost them a lot. So um, they don't have the required computers or reliable uh, resources to do it. Uh, last estimation by the, uh, the new NFCR suggested only 40% uh, of refugees they have electricity um, access to electricity or internet. Uh, also, a lot of them, they have maybe mobiles, but it's going to be a little bit expensive for them to go online. Um, so we're, we're us talking about to move online. Uh, it's very much important to understand uh, what's the capacity that the refugees actually have in order, refugees businesses they have in order to digitalize their work and start to compete online in very competitive market uh, as now it's open uh, widely. And also, Sadly, because of the COVID-19, a lot of refugees communities in, in many places of the world have been accused to be uh, of the responsible of spreading the virus, given they are not be able to stay in a lockdown or a quarantine and they have to go to work. They've been subject to uh, some kind of uh, social exclusion uh, within the community or they've been isolated, uh, forced to be uh, in, in a lockdown. We see a lot of also an increase uh, in, the, in the unconscious bias or conscious bias or bias uh, towards some refugees, especially in this uh, difficult times uh, that a lot of uh, communities and economies are facing and would they put refugees into the plane. Uh, sadly, this is also extended to the digital world and extended to the uh, world of investment uh, also for refugees, where refugees uh, cannot work full-time on their businesses. They have to have a side work or they have to go to university to keep their residencies uh, or uh, they cannot move to working visas so they don't lose uh, lose any support or the right to, for resettlements. A lot of venture capital considered that as not commitment for their business as you have a side hustle. So they've been denied um, 
of accessing some supports. So, lastly, um, that was uh, there for us. And this is uh, also in a time of uncertainty for all of us because of the COVID-19. Gladly, the vaccine is here, but we're still not sure when it's going to be distributed, when we're going to get our life back, when we're going to get technicians summit in Paris, and we all travel there to meet and connect. For refugees, there was also like a huge uncertainty. And many of the refugees, they've been stripped by their future decision and choice. Um, recently, we heard about um, some of the decisions by the Denmark to set some of the refugees and a lot of people who wanted to start their business, they are very much concerned. If I start my business now, will I be asked to go back to my country later uh, in next month? And, was, and then I will be wasting all my resources and my time uh, on that. Uh, not having a clarity on what's going to happen in the next couple of years, uh, it, it, it struck us a lot and we, we felt very much depressed because of that. So imagine what refugees entrepreneurs are feeling when they don't know what's going to happen in their future uh, at all. What's happened in the next 50 years? Will I be able uh, to stay uh, and, and be here? Uh, I, I wanted to present those challenges in order to reflect on within all of this, refugees entrepreneurs face, in addition to that, all other challenges that other entrepreneurs are facing uh, by not having, getting rejected from investors or some of the customers that don't like the product or their system crush down, uh, et cetera, like a regular businesses that are doing, but they have additional burdens uh, in the front of them that limited them from becoming the successful entrepreneurs that they want. For that, I want to maybe close with very quick uh, kind of recommendations for uh, people who's listening to us and organization and representatives. It's very much important during these times for us to prioritize inclusiveness over effectiveness. We see a lot of people that focus on refugees communities because they wanted to have successful entrepreneurs. They focus on, effect on, on effectiveness, the high quality businesses that are leaving some people behind, um, which is something that we need to, to reshift and focus on inclusiveness, bringing everyone on a table. Uh, and I believe that Fiji's mission is uh, to, to be about that. Um, active, actively promoting transparency and accountability. That's mainly because the refugees communities is built with untrust ecosystems. So we need to bring this trust back with the organizations, with the active members of the community that help us later implement positive impacts uh, and no harm approach to those societies. And then uh, lastly finishes with making sure that when we do uh, programs that we make sure that this is refugees friendly tools and processes as they cannot be able to access the same resources and access the same tools. So whenever we have something in mind, we look in, in the lens of refugees communities and refugees businesses and see how this is uh, would be useful for them and, and friendly for them uh, to access it. Uh, again, I just wanna um, thank you all. Uh, for taking for this opportunity for inviting me and I hope this is could be like the starting of many conversations that will be followed uh, with the community of tech refugees and community with students through this conference and later on in the future. Thanks again. Thank you, Ahmed. That's an incredible presentation. Um, it just shows, you know, thank you for sharing your stories and, and some of the realities and the challenges and the barriers uh, facing displaced people. I mean, we are living in unprecedented times. Um, what an incredible presentation. Thank you, Ahmed. Um, we've been going on for a couple of, uh, for well over half an hour now, and I'm just wondering if we could take a two minute break as we've just completed our first section of, of the program. Um, this next section is, is really looking at our panel's discussions around responsible innovations. So what I'm gonna suggest is why don't we just take a two minute um, uh, rest your mind break as it were, uh, just to chill out and grab a drink and it gives us an opportunity to kind of talk to others on the chat, have a look at the innovation forum, do, do network around, and we'll be back in terms of reassembling the panel in two minutes. See you then.
Okay, everyone, we're back back online. Uh, just a little bit under two minutes. Um, so if I can invite the panel members to come back on stage, please. And have their videos on. Can I take your photo for the screen? <laughs> You can try. <laughs> excellent. Well, excellent. <laughs> Great. Well, let me kickstart in kind of framing the panel. We've got an amazing lineup of uh, speakers and moderators. I'm actually very fortunate to be moderating this panel on responsible innovations and education and work uh, together with our partner, Buffalo Grid. And I'm delighted to, to be joined on the panel uh, with uh, Vanessa Ariel, who's our Chief Strategy Officer. Uh, also on the panel, as you can see, we've got Harut uh, Martin Rosan, who is the chapter lead for Tech Fuji's Lebanon. We have Eva uh, Gimniska, who is the chief executive for Humans in the Loop. Afnan Sakir is the ambassador for Women Tech Network, and Dalil Hagi, who's the founder of Tech uh, Trees Against Poverty in, in Syria. So delighted to have you all on board. Um, so with that, let me set the context um, to, to this panel. Um, you know, we've just heard from Ahmed about some of the stories and challenges uh, to this particular uh, issues of barriers and challenges to, to Syrian refugees in particular. And yesterday we, we, we heard um, the, the initiatives by Google that they're leading in terms of digital skills. Uh, I attended one of the sessions yesterday uh, where, where I believe uh, we had a team from Nigeria who actually made a wonderful Chinese quotation of an old proverb where, the, where he said, you know, give a, give a person a, a fish and you feed that person for a day. But if you teach that person to fish, you feed for a lifetime. Uh, and I thought that was very apt uh, in the context of our conversation this afternoon. Uh, over the next 30 minutes, we're gonna talk about that particular aspect. So this panel is gonna really talk about two aspects of, of value, the real value of responsible innovations to displace people and equitable access. Um, so with that, I'd like to, first of all, um, introduce, uh, go around the table, with, uh, introduce uh, Vanessa, who can tell you a bit more about Buffalo Grid. Uh, but we're gonna take the next, say, 10, 15 minutes to talk about value solutions. What are the, you know, for Storyfy, your personal experience on the ground in terms of the challenge and barriers that you've experienced for accessing education work uh, and from there. Over to you, Vanessa. Hello, thank you for the invitation, Raj, and a pleasure to be here. So just briefly, I'm Chief Strategy Officer of Buffalo Grid. And uh, what we do is we bring offline streaming and digital services to the unconnected. Um, the hubs are run off of solar panels. So basically what Buffalo Grid does is it removes the barriers for internet adoption, which as we know, they're quite, uh, they were mentioned before as well. Well, um, affordability, digital skills, relevance of content and infrastructure, very important as well, access to power. So Buffalo Grid works off of mobile networks where all of the content is constantly updated. And the purpose of us being here and our partnership with TechFugees is to be able to bring this service to the ground and to serve those who need it the most the same way as you know, for refugees, by refugees. That's, that's the whole purpose. We are not the experts, all of you guys are, and we're here to support your work. So thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Harut, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thank you, Raj. Uh, I'm pleased to, to be here with you all. Uh, I'm Harut Madirosyan, uh, originally from Syria, living in Lebanon like 10 years. Uh, through my journey in Lebanon, I, I was lucky to, to, to know about tech fugees and to join uh, their chapter in Lebanon. Uh, I, uh, I work uh, as a developer in humanitarian uh, sector, uh, software developer, and uh, I'm excited to join this panel uh, with all of you to talk about uh, responsible innovation. Thank you, Arut. Eva, do you, do you have yourself to introduce yourself quickly and, story, and explain what you do in the context of responsible innovations? Sure. Thank you for having me, Raj, and I'm very happy to be here along with everyone else. Harut, we've actually been chatting a lot today because we're preparing for a pilot of our 
model um, and our type of work in Lebanon with the help of the local branch of refugees. So we're really excited about this and I'm very happy to be collaborating with him right now. Um, in terms of what we do, uh, we're a social enterprise, we're based in Bulgaria and we provide accessible and easy freelance job opportunities to conflict affected people. Uh, these are job opportunities related to data annotation uh, and image labeling for artificial intelligence. So it's a very exciting field, but um, I would say that the nature of the work is very easy and it makes it a nice uh, springboard to other freelance online digital work opportunities for people who don't have a lot of previous experience. Uh, we work not only in Bulgaria, but also in Syria, Turkey and Iraq uh, with some incredible uh, local organizations that we're partnering with. And uh, we're preparing a pilot currently, not only in Lebanon, but also in Afghanistan. And we're really trying to target not only displaced people, but also people that are, that are currently living in places of armed conflict or you know, the people who remained. Um, and we're really trying to target economies that have um, suffered uh, due, to this place, uh, due to displacement and armed conflict as well. Mm. Thank you, Eva. It's, it's interesting you've mentioned uh, some of the challenges. Now, I know Afnan, you, you, you obviously work with a lot of women across the region. Could you share your experience and some of the initiatives that you're leading? Uh, yeah, so first, thank you, Raj, for having me today. And uh, I'm very pleased like, uh, to be with you guys. Uh, very like inspiring stories like by uh, Ahmed, I just like heard. I know Ahmed like before, and he's doing a great job. Um, so, um, so I am, um, so I'm, from Jordan, like uh, uh, originally, or like Jordanian Palestinian, uh, and uh, I'm doing like uh, technical product management, project management in the software industry, um, uh, mainly like software product and services and ERP solutions. Uh, and uh, I came last year to the UK to study, uh, uh, like to to pursue my master's degree in innovation and entrepreneurship from the University of Warwick. After that, I moved to London, uh, where I uh, was like, uh, I want to ex like explore uh, like opportunities, like expand my horizons and network, and where I have started like my uh, new work. Um, so apart from like professional life, I'm also like uh, like I'm considering myself like a social uh, uh, entrepreneur. Uh, I've, uh, I have uh, like. Um, uh, attended and, and participated in international um, uh, like uh, program. Uh, the first one is tech woman program that is like um, for women from the Middle East or empowering women in the Middle East and uh, uh, in South Africa. I've also joined the uh, Princeton Trust like initiated by uh, uh, Prince Charles here in the UK uh, as uh, emerging leader from the Middle East. And also lately I have received the achievement scholarship to attend and pursue my master's degree. Um, I work like with women, uh, like uh, with entrepreneurs, to be honest, like uh, women and uh, founders in the back in Jordan, and also work with um, uh, like, uh, like parts from my experience, I'm doing like mentorship and training, where I used to work also with uh, like uh, women in the uh, refugee camps in, in Jordan. Where I had like a very like uh, uh, um, impactful and uh, uh, like uh, nice stories from there. Um, uh, so yeah, I so my, mainly like um, I'm not like the one who is uh, is contributing to their like uh, experience or to their like uh, um, uh, stories, but they are actually adding to my story and adding to my uh, experience. So I'm, I'm I'm really glad that I have worked with all these like uh, empowered women across like the Jordan and even like uh, the region. Uh, so, yeah. That's great, Afna. That, thank you for sharing that. It's an incredible experience. Before I actually go and introduce Dalil, uh, I'd love to ask you, you know, with your experience, Afna, what, what specific challenges or barriers did the, uh, did the women face in the Middle East region in terms of accessing education and work? What, do, can you share any insights around that? Um, so I think the challenges, um, so I will speak mainly about the like the displaced like women or the women in the remote areas because those like the most uh, vulnerable or the most who are facing like challenges in the Middle East. 
especially with the, the accessibility to the uh, education. But maybe there is something that we need to appreciate about the current uh, like norm or the current like situation of the uh, global pandemic, um, which is like uh, like now uh, working in the you know like uh, the remote uh, or virtual environment, which has like given. Uh, or like kind of uh, facilitate like the accessibility for work or education from uh, anywhere in the world. But again, the problem is in the infrastructure itself. So if there is like no like infrastructure, like in term of technology in a place like PCs or or like internet or or like uh, um, you know like equipment that they can use to connect, then this is like uh, one of the barriers that we need to speak of. Um, you know, like there is certain cultural barrier, like speaking about the technology field in a specific, which is very demanding uh, field. And, you know, like sometimes it might require uh, the woman to work for long uh, working hours. This is another like barrier, uh, especially like given the culture in the like in, uh, in the Middle East. So these yes. like main barriers I can I can just like uh, uh, shed the light on. Thank you, Afghan. Thank you. Very insightful. Uh, Dalil, obviously, I, I, I was inspired with your presentation yesterday. I'd love to if you could share your experience and in, in the work that you do in, in helping the, the people in Syria. Absolutely, Raj. It is so wonderful to see, to, to, to listen to these talks. Um, yeah, my name is Dalil. Before going to talk a little bit about trees against poverty, um, I want to revise about the, the some notes being raised in here. Um, <clears throat> it's simply migration, as you said. It's been part of our life cycle from very old times. Uh, it kind of is a nature. Sometimes it happens without conflict, people uh, fleeing because of storms. We Every winter, every month, we hear that people fleeing their village because there's been high speed wind or storms. So it seems like affect uh, different people, rich people, poor people, uh, educated people, or other people, and so on. Um, and of course, Sometimes, most of the time, affect uh, people when there's a conflict. Um, for these displaced people, they've, they've chosen their, the wise decision to be a migrant than uh, to be part of the conflict. So being a part of the conflict, you, you increase the problem and make more, more problems. So they choose to leave their home, leave everything behind, and be um, migrants and go somewhere else. Um, at that time, it came a responsibility on other people to support uh, these displaced people, and uh, this is what Trees Against Poverty wants to do. Um, of course, these displaced people will not be able to participate fully until they have enough food on their table, they're able to send their kids to schools, um, they have warm uh, shelters. Uh, and it seems like they're doing very, very well when they are get empowered. We see examples everywhere. For example, if we talk about COVID-19, the first uh, vaccine was developed by uh, migrants. Uh, we, we're using here Zoom app. It seems uh, the founder um, called uh, Eric Yun, he's a Chinese migrated to US and he rejected nine times uh, for the visa to UK, to uh, the US. So it seems okay. they, they're able to do well, but at the first place, they need to be empowered. and. Uh, what Trees Against Poverty wants to do is to give them a uh, kind of livelihood by uh, letting them uh, to, to have to get to um, to get jobs. So what we're trying to do is um, helping them to get jobs, but at the same time we're helping the environment. So what Trees Against Poverty wants to do is we, we, we encourage people to plant trees in these war affected countries and um, because I'm from Syria, I've been, uh, I've seen the conflict there. I've been part of the experience and we're starting from Syria. So Trees Against Poverty uh, sponsor people and encourage people to plant trees. So we helping the environment and uh, the planting will be done in these war affected countries. And the planting will be done by these internally displaced people. Uh, this is about Trees Against Poverty. Um, um, I will um, I totally agree with you, Raj, about the example you said, don't give them a fish, but told them how to fish. <laughs> Thank you, Dalil. Uh, I, I, lo I, love, uh, I love the initiative that you do, and I, and I love the sort of the sustainability initiatives that you're, you're enabling. That's great. Um, 
I, I you know, the, we, we are living in very un, in, uh, in pre unprecedented times with the pandemic and everything. Um, I want to draw Vanessa in, in the discussion here because, you know, Vanessa, in your role with Buffalo Grid, um, I wanted to ask you about the role of content because, you know, content becomes a, a sort of a magnetic force to empower uh, knowledge, you could say, to, to individuals who are being marginalized. Could you, could you kind of share your experience? I mean, obviously you work very closely with many humanitarian organizations around the world. It would be great if you could share some of the experience you're seeing in terms of addressing some of the gender inequalities around and educating uh, aspects and, and work. But the, following on your quote about the fish, there's one that comes to mind, which is knowledge is power and power is freedom. So yes. a lot of the people who are displaced are trapped in, in, a, in a certain condition or a situation. And we know that education is at the basis of elevating anybody's standard of living, whether it's with entrepreneurial practices or reading and writing skills, soft skills, digital skills, they're all based on education. So that's why being able to bring the content to the most vulnerable is fundamental. And this is where the innovation is, is, is you know, frugal innovation is I think personally one of the greatest uh, um, concepts or words that I ever learned in the last year and a half to two years. It's, it's an amazing concept, but it, it, the only way that it works is that there, it, there has to be a collaboration of everybody that is involved in the process, not just those that will benefit because we need to be able to give people what they need and want. But from the entire ecosystem, from the people that manufacture them, design them, you have to have a, a constant communication. And that's also another education process that we all live on a day-to-day -day basis. So we can't assume that we know everything. We're all here to learn from one another. And that's why, you know, listening to what uh, Dalil was saying, you know, people need to feel empowered uh, to have a purpose. Uh, with education, you can open, you know, the world of people's purpose or, or belief in themselves and potential. So giving a certain level of freedom in a lot of the conversations that we've been having in the last few weeks, particularly the last three days with your colleagues on the ground of Tech Fugees are mind blowing. How innovative everybody is, how collaborative the spirit is. I think the world has a lot to learn from the refugee community and the displaced community, truth be told. But it's, <laughs> it's fundamental. Yeah, no, thank you. Education is fundamental. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'm hoping that you know the for the audience out there, you know, listening into the panel. Hopefully, this gives you a context of of the nature of of responsible innovations and kind of looking at some of the areas. I would encourage everybody in the audience. Hopefully, um, you know, do ask questions on the chat uh, if there's more things you'd like to know. Um, we're going to move the conversation a little bit more about equitable access, as and in that regard, obviously, we we do live at a a technology centric world and we're all digitally connected now and we're, we're doing the things all virtually and online as we do um but you know the technology and displaced people don't you know it's kind of the dichotomy and i wanted to understand a little bit more about the aspects of work because ultimately you know for those individuals who are traditionally marginalized do need to go back to work uh, and there's many aspects of work and many opportunities around that uh, so I wanted to have an open conversation with everybody on the panel from your experience. Um, obviously, we're seeing technology kind of moving away from, say, tech for good. We've seen bad technology in terms of tech for control, the use of artificial intelligence and building an unconscious bias and how that's kind of filtering you know, uh, into the work environment. So could you maybe share, maybe I can ask uh, Eva, you know, for, since you're in the AI world, maybe you could share some of your experience in, in that context. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, it's such a broad and, and also challenging topic to talk about when it comes to work inclusion and uh, the labor market, because it really depends, uh, you know, as we discussed earlier on also the legal barriers in each country. And I think that this is one of the, one of the biggest challenges that even if you have the most brilliant entrepreneurship idea and you know you want to empower people through you know an amazing opportunity if there is no legal way for people to receive salaries be legally employed then you might actually be exposing them to a lot of uh risks yeah. you know we're uh facing that currently in terms of freelance work because a lot of organizations like ours have seen okay maybe through coding skills through programming, being a freelancer, people are actually going to be independent of their uh, immediate physical environment and they're gonna be able to access opportunities on a global level 
and now wherever they are, even if they are on the move, they will be able to earn a living. Uh, but you know, freelance work is still part of the gig economy, which exposes people to a lot of vulnerabilities. When we're talking about the lack of social security, medical insurance, you know, a lot of rights that people have fought long for, and um, it's actually becoming very fashionable to just you know say, oh, I'm a freelancer, I'm uh, you know self-dependent, I earn my own money, I'm. Uh, you know, self-employed, uh, but especially when a person is already quite vulnerable and they don't have that safety net and those protections, um, it's even more challenging to, you know, make a su successful freelancer out of them, for example. So there are a lot of challenges here, I would say, especially in our world, because we're trying to uh, channel work opportunities to different countries. Here in Bulgaria, refugees and asylum seekers are allowed to work, so we have civil contracts with them. In other countries, it's really difficult, especially when we're talking about Syria. Um, currently, you know, transferring payments to Syria is a really big issue. Um, same thing, you know, or similar situation for Iraq and um, Turkey, it's a little bit easier. But um, definitely, you know, making sure that, uh, especially for people, that money actually reaches them, it's a really big issue. And a lot of the, you know, major solution, uh, solutions out there like PayPal and wallets and so on they just do not support displaced people and people who do not have you know legal uh, id cards and uh, the right to work in their own country or the right to access a bank account um so i would say the biggest challenge for us has actually been this type of legal environment and i would say the the geopolitical environment which predetermines you know all uh, very exciting technological efforts. Um, if you know there are political and and uh, legal barriers, uh, even if you have a great technical idea, you might not be able to actually make it work for displaced people. Mm, I see. Uh, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Harut. Um, obviously, you're in Beirut, and Beirut has gone through so much um, in the recent months and years. Um, I mean, in the aspect of work. Could you share your experience and obviously, you know, do you see some of the opportunities of applying technology and innovations to kind of address some of the, the current challenges in Beirut at the moment? Yes. Uh, as Eva mentioned, uh, especially in Middle East uh, for refugees, it's very difficult uh, to work or uh, to have the chance uh, uh, to use their skills in the, in the labor market. Uh, because of the laws and regulations sometimes because of the economic situation or unemployment uh, the, the high unemployment rate in the host country uh, that will not allow refugees already to uh, to compete the locals in the in the labor market and Lebanon is uh, one of uh, one of these countries uh, where a lot uh, where a lot of refugees uh, uh, are educated. They, they are already in Lebanon uh, for 10 years, talking about the Syrians. And the Palestinian refugees, for example, uh, for more than 30 years, they are already in Lebanon and, and even more. And uh, they are not allowed to work. Uh, from my experience, uh, I was introduced to the remote work uh, maybe in 2018 or something like that. Uh, and I found that the remote work is a solution uh, for, for these because uh, when you are working remotely, you are using uh, technology and you are using your skills to work uh, and to be productive. And you are uh, you are entering uh, the income to the country, to the host country, and you are helping and supporting uh, your family and yourself, uh, which is uh, which is uh, I I found uh, uh, innovative solution for for this unemployment uh, problem for refugees. However. Uh, uh, there are uh, a lot of, uh, let's say, obstacles or challenges while, uh, while working remotely. Uh, I can start with uh, poor infrastructure of electricity and internet, uh, where the refugees are suffering a lot, as Afnan mentioned uh, in her talk. Uh, also, uh, there is the, the payment methods, uh, which also Eva talked about. Uh, it's very difficult uh, for undocumented or uh, or for an individual uh, who doesn't have uh, uh, banking representation uh, to get paid or to receive payments. Uh, here, I, I don't know if it's time uh, to talk a little bit about the, the responsible innovation. 
I mean, uh, for, for example, uh, for the payment solutions, there are many, many uh, innovative solutions. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, there is, uh, there is uh, something missing, especially uh, it's not, uh, for example, if, uh, if there is a solution, a payment solution uh, for refugees in, let's say, in Europe, it won't be the same for refugees in Middle East or Africa or other countries. Uh, so we need uh, more, uh, let's say, innovation in this area uh, that uh, be inclusive or taking in consideration the situation in other countries. Uh, also, uh, I've been noticed that uh, uh, for the remote work itself, uh, not, not all the solutions are uh, working in all countries. Uh, for example, uh, there are uh, there are many great, I can say, brilliant, great ideas about remote work for refugees or displaced people. But again, when you will, uh, let's say, when you will recruit, the first step, the recruitment process, is very difficult, and it's not easy for refugees uh, to start or to get involved uh, in those solutions. Uh, Moreover, uh, moreover uh, I saw many other, uh, let's say, uh, work uh, ideas or uh, initiatives uh, that, that uh, were not flexible, uh, that couldn't handle the uncertainty. Uh, here talking about the pandemic. I mean, when uh, the pandemic start, uh, many, uh, many uh, solutions were already active and uh, let's say recruiting refugees for work. Uh, but uh, they they were like stuck uh, in middle of nowhere. What to do or how to change uh, their their process? So the uh, uh, so they uh, let's say adopt the change the change of the pandemic. Uh, so uh, I have a lot of to talk, uh, especially when it comes to the data part. But I think I will I will give uh, the time. Uh, for the other panelists as well. Absolutely, thank you, Arid. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a very deep talk. We, we could actually talk for hours, right? Um, yes. <laughs> but I, I wanted to draw in Afnan, because uh, obviously Afnan, you're, you're in uh, Jordan. Um, you know, obviously we are seeing, you know, the, the, the pandemic now increasing, as I said, gender inequalities that's happening within displaced people. I think Harid obviously talked about the aspect of data, the, the aspect of trust and inclusion. Um, could you share maybe some of your aspects uh, in terms of working with the women in, in the region? What sort of innovations that you're, you're seeing that actually is re becoming responsible in kind of addressing some of the equalities and, and what sort of areas are they looking at? Uh, absolutely. Um, so I would like uh, first to uh, reflect on uh, like uh, Eva's like uh, uh, talk. Uh, she she like really like touch base on many uh, like challenges uh, uh, around uh, like starting like uh, all, like starting like a freelance job or being like your own boss. Uh, so for 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 instance, I used to deliver some trainings around uh, uh, about the uh, starting your online business or starting your business using like you know those like uh, um, 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 like tools like. Shopify and, and other technologies. But what I realized that uh, if you got like uh, access to these like uh, technologies and um, uh, if you know, like, uh, like those women got like the access to start their own business, they still uh, like face other challenges, uh, which, which, which become like uh, more and more uh, uh, like restrictive to them in Jordan, for instance, like the uh, logistics stuff or the uh, regulation regarding the custom which might restrict them from like, uh, you know, like processing uh, their like uh, products or, uh, or, or doing this uh, like uh, online press and uh, like online uh, presence like more successful. Uh, so if we want again to speak about responsible innovation, so innovation is about like creating product or like service or a process that is, is uh, adding values to people and uh, you know like uh, giving them like accessibility and it, at the same time it has to be like you uh, like user friendly like it, it has to uh, take the uh, the user journey uh, element into account so when we speak about the uh, responsible innovation for such like uh, businesses they need to consider also the how to facilitate uh, 
uh, the uh, accessibility to this product and how to be like valuable in terms of the uh, uh, like um, uh, accessibility and how uh, I can today um, like manage to uh, to like undertake the business from all uh, like uh, perspectives. It's not like only focusing on one one area, which for instance, like just like how to start the business or how to position my business or how to like uh, uh, target the customers, but also how to do like the whole process, like from A to Z, uh, more like uh, um, uh, easier and and uh, uh, manageable for them. Uh, so this is for me like the responsible innovation. It's not is, is also supporting them to uh, to deliver. It's not all, all, only to to start, but also to deliver. Uh, so yeah. So this is it for me. That's great, great uh, uh, response, uh, and uh, Afna, that's brilliant. Um, I can see some comments coming through from chat. Actually, the, the, the discussions is stirring lots yeah. of good positive feedback. Uh, we have one particular question from an audience member account. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, we, the question is, what are the advantages of digital livelihoods slash work for refugees compared to traditional livelihoods, especially for refugees living in the camps? Um, who, who would like to answer that question? Well, I could go for it, uh, Raj. Thank you, Dalil. Yeah, sure, definitely. So this is what, um, in terms, I will link it to trees against poverty. Uh, what we want to do is to help these refugees to uh, get access to kind of livelihoods. It seems like it's not easy task to do. So we need to be innovative and we need to find a smart way to do it. And one of the smart way we live in tech era. So to use technology to help them. And I think um, um, it sounds like um, the best way to help them as we live, as I said, we live in technology time and it's the easiest way sometimes as uh, Harun said, uh, we're working remotely. So it seems like uh, it works well. Um, sometimes doesn't need, uh, it, it, it overcome the location barriers, um, but at the same time, uh, it, can, uh, it, it might create some uh, other barriers how to give these uh, displaced people access to um, to tech. Uh, I see uh, Vanessa companies, they do similar to this when they help uh, these displaced people to access cloud, uh, cloud uh, education videos or uh, uh, <coughs> other stuff. Um, I will, if I go back to um, the point about, I, I, I'm aware we don't have much time, but maybe quickly I will go to, back to the point is, about uh, access to work. Uh, if I link it to my own experience, um, I've been lucky to coming from tech background uh, and living in London. It seems like many companies here start to believe in diversity and start to believe in, um, uh, in inclusion. So it seems like it's a good mentality for many companies here to have this mentality to uh, embrace the idea to bring people from different backgrounds, including refugees and displaced people to their teams, which something encouraging and help uh, a lot of refugees here in the UK. That's awesome, Dalil, thank you so much. Raj, but just a quick comment and or a question. I mean, it seems that, you know, the world is moving so fast to digital that we are forgetting a lot of traditional livelihoods, but there is a need, not just in the displaced sector, but globally to readapt. So, you know, my children are 17 and uh, almost 18 and 16. Th th what they're learning now is completely different to what I learned, my parents learned, and my grandparents learned. And we do see a shift for people going back to more traditional livelihoods as well. So I, th I think that's not just a, a localized, uh, it's an amazing question, but I think we yeah. need to macro it to humanity itself. Uh, um, yeah. and, and then address it as, a, as, a, as an everybody uh, yes. situation as opposed to just what's going on in camps or settlements or in, in, di in different parts of the world of where the displaced are a, a focal point. Yes, absolutely. Uh, actually, we've just had a one question on the back of what you've just said, Vanessa, and it's very timely. And probably this is probably the last question we'll take uh, from the audience, given the time we're running it to. Uh, so the question here is, what is your suggestion then to humanitarian organizations about customizing their programs, especially uh, the ones that operate in multiple countries and respond to various needs. <laughs> mm. 
Knowledge sharing is my vote for that. <laughs> I think sharing knowledge and let people choose what works for them. We cannot, def every, every culture is different. Every subculture is different. The, the combinations of the people where they come from. So I think it's just knowledge share and allow people to curate what they, what they need and want. That would be my contribution to that question. That's great. Any, any final thoughts from, from anybody else on the panel on that one? Uh, I, I have one addition to what Vanessa said. Uh, I, I would suggest, uh, sorry, for, sorry for the noise. I would suggest uh, to, to include, uh, let's say, refugees in the, in the planning uh, uh, for those activities or to find solutions, because it's very important uh, not only to include, uh, I mean, uh, not only to look at refugees as beneficiaries, they should be at some uh, part stakeholders. Uh, they should have their part in uh, planning, researching, and implementing uh, the, the, let's say, uh, the initiative or uh, whatever is uh, the organization, the humanitarian organization we work on. That is so true, uh, Harit. Yeah. So I think everything is people-centric, and, and that is what it's about, is finding the most valuable solutions <laughs> that help people more than anything else. So, I think we've had an amazing panel session and I want to thank everybody on the panel. So a big a virtual applause to everybody on the panel. Thank you so much for the time um, and uh, we'll move to the next panel. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, wow, that was quite an amazing uh, panel session. So we're actually going to flow, continue the flow uh, with the next panel session. Um, I'm delighted this topic is going to be about health. <laughs> and that's quite a deep topic um, concerning the current climate we're living in. So this is a, uh, we've got some amazing individuals today. Um, I'm, we've got uh, Matthew Gardner, who's, who works with our team here in Tech Fugees as part of our data hub. He's going to tell you a little bit more about that. Uh, we have a representative here from Kenya, Philomena Wange, uh, welcome. Uh, we have an international crew here from Jordan as well, from Ahmed Basad, and, and hopefully, I'm hoping that Neil will join us. Uh, we had a difficulty joining, so hopefully he's on, but if not, no worries. So if they can ask all the panel members to join on the stage, we'll have a great conversation about what we just talked about. Thank you. Great. So this topic is all about responsible innovations for health. Um, clearly, we are living in the times of the pandemic and health is at the forefront of everybody's mind today in terms of getting vaccinated and everything else. Uh, but with access to health, um, there are challenges, right? We are seeing the, the, the marginalization of refugees and displaced people getting access even to vaccines and COVID-19. Um, so maybe I can just start the discussion. So I'm delighted to, to be co-moderating this session with uh, my, my colleague, Matthew Gardner, um, who's, who's leading the initiative of Data Hub. So maybe I could draw in Matthew to kind of talk about the whole COVID-19 situation, what Data Hub is all about and, and your experience. Over to you, Matthew. Sure. So hi, I'm Matthew Gardner. I'm one of the founding members of TechPGs. And actually COVID-19 brought me back. So I was very busy. I'm probably on mute. No, I'm not, which is good. Learn that. Uh, very busy with TechFugees from the beginning through to kind of mid-2017. Um, very busy traveling, then obviously came rushing back around COVID. And we very quickly developed a data hub, which is a kind of resource for crowdsourced data um, by refugees, by displaced people, for displaced people, also from NGOs too. Um, but really brings right up to the minute data and appropriate data, relevant data to people who need it. So not only NGOs and aid agencies, but actually people on the ground. So that's been going very well. It's scaled very quickly. Um, we're developing it from a, from a tech angle more. And we've also been lucky to have, I think now 10 live sessions, which have been related to each part of the data hub. So hearing directly from people in 
in uh, refugee camps, displaced areas, all kinds of people really, and um, kind of uh, finding some tech resources or appealing for tech resources uh, to help them with their work. So kind of Data Hub is there, live data and the uh, live sessions bring some more life to it and kind of uh, real life stories, I would say. Thank you, Matthew. It's incredible how you and the rest of the team have actually, you know, when the pandemic hit, how, how it galvanized so quickly uh, to create Data Hub um, in terms of it's now become like a, an aggregated open data platform of, of information and both top down information from institutions on how COVID-19 is, is impacting mm -hmm. the displaced, but also grassroots data as well. Um, and it's becoming very insightful around that. Um, so, yeah, so I think on that note, and I can see they, on the chat, we've just shared the, the Data Hub link. So for those in the audience, do check that out. It's an amazing platform. You'll see the heat map of, of some of the reports. We are looking for being an open platform. We are looking for increasing contributors. So if you're out there, you can help us and kind of shape that. Please do come on board and help talk to us. But on the panel, we do have, you know, a global team here. And uh, so I want to draw in Philomena from Kenya. Philomena, you do some amazing work, um, you know, working with refugees and displaced people in the, in the settlement camps. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, some of the initiatives that you're leading on the ground and what, what, what sort of challenges and barriers you, you've seen? Thanks, Raj. Um, so I'm Philomena Mwangi, representing Techfugees Kenya and more specifically um, a group called Faceless Hackers. So Faceless Hackers was born out of a hackathon that was held in 2019. And this hackathon was centered around creating an e-health solution. And the problem statement was developed in collaboration with the Kenya Red Cross, which is responsible for all health related um, issues uh, within the refugee camps, not only in the refugee camps, but in this context, they are responsible for health-related issues within uh, Kakuma and Dada refugee camps. So during this hackathon, the problem statement was that um, in terms of responding to health challenges within the camps, the challenge is that, first of all, the camp is very vast. And so um, the process of going door to door to uh, speak to refugees and gathering the, um, any health challenges they might be facing through the help of community health volunteers usually takes a lot of time. And so uh, the purpose of the hackathon was to come up with an, uh, a technology solution that would solve this problem and sort of um, uh, shorten the turnaround time between uh, reporting a health related incident and responding to it from the, side, from the side of the Kenya Red Cross. And so out of this hackathon, the group Faceless Hackers won. And so TechFugees Kenya has been supporting Faceless Hackers in developing the solution. And currently what we're doing is that we're piloting that solution. And so a little bit about the solution is that it's, uh, it's threefold. It's a web dashboard, a mobile application and a USSD application. So the mobile and USSD applications are used by the community health volunteers uh, to log uh, health related complaints uh, from refugees and displaced people. Um, so currently the pilot is running in Kalo Bay settlement. And so these community health volunteers um, go door to door within each household. And whenever it is that they, uh, there's a health challenge to be reported, then they use the uh, USSD application or the mobile application to log these uh, complaints. On the side of the Kenya Red Cross, uh, they use the web dashboard to, uh, to look at incoming uh, incidences that have been reported and assigning the right resources to respond to this, uh, to the, the cases that have been reported. And so ultimately the goal is that we reduce the turnaround time uh, with which uh, health challenges are responded to and basically having also a system where we can close the loop so that we know that um, at, at the end of a certain period, this is the number of challenges, uh, health issues that were reported and you are able to respond to whatever percentage. And so that basically is what we are trying to achieve with the solution and the name of the solution is eHealth e Watch. Thanks. Oh, thank you for filling me. That's really insightful and, and, and great, great initiative. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, we do have a, uh, we do have Ahmed in Jordan as well. So we, it's great to have another Jordanian on the team. And so 
Um, I know, Ahmed, you've been working very diligently um, on, on some key initiatives in, in, in the area around health. Could you explain a little bit more about your, your story and, and some of the initiatives you're leading? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, Matthew, Raj, uh, and everyone for setting this up uh, and your uh, extraordinary efforts uh, along the years. Uh, and um, I, I must say that uh, I've been engaged uh, so much with, with the tech, uh, tech refugees, uh, exceptional work and exceptional uh, initiatives. And um, uh, first, uh, when I started to, to, to work on, 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 on the subject, uh, I was a student at the university uh, pulling out uh, six to seven uh, and even eight hours uh, shifts after the university uh, to, to, to pay my tuition fees. And um, uh, from that, I was working with, with, with all kinds of immigrants and refugees. And I, I can see how, how, how hard is it uh, for them to, to, uh, uh, to cover their, their family expenses with, with the wages that we were making uh, on, on, on retail and whatever jobs that we were doing. And, uh, and, and that, that, can, that gives you uh, a first-hand uh, um, experience on, on how hard is it to, to, to get yourself uh, and your family members uh, to get covered med in, a, in a healthcare aspect and, and to, to, to get the, the proper medical insurance. And from that, <clears throat> we, we were trying, me and uh, uh, the exceptional team of volunteers that were on, on the project and is there on the project remaining, uh, that we wanted to help in a way uh, to, to, to seek what's, what's the uh, primary issue with, with, with healthcare, especially for refugees. And um, we, we couldn't fund a multi-billion dollar uh, aspect of a, of a project that, that, that will hire hundreds of doctors or hundreds of physicians uh, and, and to seek medical attention for, for the refugees. And we, will, we were searching for what's the most consuming, uh, most uh, time consuming part of, of the healthcare process for the refugees. And it, it was actually taking the medical uh, records for the refugees uh, for the first time and to contact them uh, and to engage with, 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 with a patient uh, uh, at the first meeting or the first date maybe. <laughs> and from that, uh, that was the, 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 the initial start for, for the Dr. X. And uh, we identified the, the, the issue of, of time consumption uh, as, as, as a big um, time consuming uh, task. And at the same time, uh, what most medical issues were happening because uh, there were uh, missing data in the um, medical history for the refugees. And from that, we started uh, uh, to, 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 to build a solution and we pivoted so much uh, and, and tried to iterate uh, over and over again with, with what we're trying to, 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 to solve uh, in a way that um, we took a lot of feedback from the physicians themselves. Uh, and, uh, and you can imagine a doctor that is treating 200 people uh, at a day, uh, how, how hard is it for him or her? Uh, at the same time, you can block into that uh, certain um, uh, medical conditions that needs uh, a weekly uh, or a bi-monthly visits like pregnancy. Uh, and every time he or she, uh, as a pregnant woman, has to meet with a new physician each two weeks uh, to explain to him uh, or her uh, what's what's the uh, medical condition uh, that she's having and what's the progress that she is having, and um, trying to deal with that uh, was very hard. And in terms of localizing solutions, I tried to to make a best fit uh, um, design that can help the local community and to to help different uh, aspects at the same time of of, of tackling the issue. Uh, and 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 I, and I would say that. Um, <clears throat> Sometimes people would, would mix between actions uh, and, and being patient. Mm. And, uh, and I think that uh, being patient ends up with, with taking actions. And I think it's, it's, uh, the essence of building a successful project is to wait and, uh, and to, to, to take uh, your time to build the solution and to pivot between different aspects of, of the projects that you're trying to do. And at the same time, uh, you, you, you're trying to build um, localized solution, but uh, you need to take uh, the uh, proper uh, measures, uh, like a design thinking approach in a way uh, that you take uh, an iterative process, so on and so forth, until the, you reach uh, a, a, a certain point of saturation, a, a certain point of delivery 
for the local community and the, 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 the audience that you're trying to target. And I, and I think that sometimes technology would be ahead of its time. Um, for example, uh, uh, <laughs> and I would say that, uh, that this is a very famous example, uh, the Newton for, by the Apple company was released in the 80s and it's, it's the first tablet computing uh, device. And, uh, but th that was not very successful until, uh, until the iPhone was released because uh, there were no internet connection. There was no, no 2G, 3G uh, uh, coverage. And um, the Newton was, was a big failure in the 80s for, for tablet computing. And I think that uh, once you have the patient and, the, um, and, the, uh, and you take the action at the proper uh, timing and uh, the, at the proper uh, place and location, I, I think that uh, you, you can have much, much more uh, targeted audience, a, a successful uh, project. And, 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 and then you can build a, a human design uh, oriented product and then you can deliver it to, to the uh, local community that you're trying to, 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 to help. And, um, and, and um, I would say that in the first early stages of the project that we were trying to uh, advocate for healthcare uh, and medical records for the refugees, uh, we were contacting refugees through social media and um, talking about healthcare and uh, your family members on social media is not very common for refugees. And actually that was not very successful for us uh, to contact uh, people and to ask them about their healthcare and their family members on online. But rather when we were uh, doing construct and constructing like one-to-one -one sessions and trying to convince them and face-to-face -face with, with our amazing volunteers mm -hmm. that they were trying to um, convince the refugee families and to help them to understand how important is it to keep track of your medical record. It, the, the, the results were amazing because they trust face-to-face -face interaction rather than social media, uh, blog posting, and <laughs> reading about it on, on the newspaper. And uh, uh, Ahmed, you've actually raised quite a several points. Uh, I'm going to come back to you on this because you've raised some very interesting points, which I'd love to come back to you. But I want to try and Neil it at the moment, because I know Neil is probably a, is a medical specialist, right? You know, I hope I'm right in saying that. Um, and you're doing some amazing work in Syria. So Neil, can you, can you share a little bit about, your, about yourself and, and what your initiatives are currently doing? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Raj. And uh, it's a great to meet uh, Philomena and Ahmed and all other speakers. Uh, my name is Nail. Um, I'm currently based in Gaza, Palestine. Um, I graduated from medical school. Uh, I'm a doctor. Uh, I also has a ma I have a master's degree in digital marketing and a second master's degree in health data analytics and machine learning. Uh, it's a quite multidisciplinary, uh, but I'm enjoying it and uh, it serves me very well in building Dr. Sila, which is an Arabic um, personal health assistant. Um, so uh, we work with refugees and um, one important point is when migrants and displaced people move to other places, they move with their languages, emotions, cultures, and everything. That's their whole world. And um, for some time, they feel disconnected from these new places that they were displaced to. Um, and this is how we can help, basically. So uh, we built a personal health assistant to uh, support refugees and immigrants um, in countries where they feel like there's a cultural gap in the healthcare system. So basically we focus on uh, Arab refugees in Turkey because Turkish healthcare service providers only speak Turkish, but Arabs speak Arabic, sometimes English, and this is where uh, the gap happens. Um, so we support the Arabic language, um, we take care of like uh, like culture and um, like the native Arabic user experience, etc. And we take that into account before introducing um, our product. Um, so basically, it's just like a tool where you can get like some instant answers um, and a personalized experience, um, and that's somehow efficient for people who do not have like um, like a proper access to healthcare to healthcare. Um, another point is like equality because um, like the quality of healthcare services and even the access is not equal um, 
among like different Arabic countries and also inside the one country. So like, uh, like cities, countryside, etc. cetera. Um, so it's not the same level of access or like, uh, like quality of healthcare. Um, so basically we offer like an equal access, an equal access to information, uh, an equal access to um, like same level of experience across different markets. Um, we're currently at a very early stage uh, we have like around 250 users. It's still like very few, and we're currently raising investment. Oh, thank you, Neil. You know, it's interesting. You know, the, the health topic is, is deeply resonates for me because you know my family are full of doctors. You know, I have my daughter who's who's currently an NHS doctor, working battling in the front lines of COVID, and you know, with that, there is already you know the trust relationship between a doctor and a patient. That, that is always a given, right? We, we understand that. But, you know, we, we now live in a digital world, right? Where everything, all the records, as, as Ahmed said, are, are now online, you can get access to it. And I, th I wanted to pick up on what Ahmed said earlier about, you know, data being missing, because, you know, we're, you're working in very vulnerable environments with working with displaced people, not all the data is there, not everybody's got identities and so forth. Um, how does that how does that challenge um, your relationship as doctors and, and and you know getting that trust relationship in the digital space? I mean, I just wanted to open that question out to everybody on the panel, and maybe maybe Neil, if you can, since you're a doctor, so maybe you can you have some thoughts around that too. So um, honestly, there there will always be like a gap. There's nothing that can compete against like. The human touch right so like being there being physically for the patient it's something completely different but again like the last like 18 months like the COVID-19 situation has changed actually everything and uh, it became like more of something that countries have to do rather than it's just like an option we want like to digitize like services um, and that actually helped like a lot of companies startups and even initiatives to, um, to, 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 to like introduce their solutions and services. And people are like more accepting because they're like, they'll be always like afraid of like the risk of going to a hospital like or a clinic and catching like COVID. Uh, so that helped a lot. Um, but again, like if we can like improve the user experience to be like more human, that would be always great. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe I could draw Philomena too, because you know Philomena, you obviously work on the ground with with Red Cross, as you mentioned. Uh, in the context of that conversation, are you are you seeing a, a slightly different dynamic uh, with working with the displaced people on the ground in terms of establishing, you could say, digital trust with, with the folks that you're helping? Um, I'd say yes, and this is because. So right from the beginning of you know this whole idea of coming up with an e-health solution we engaged the Kenya Red Cross right from the beginning. And this is because firstly, um, the Kenya Red Cross work on the ground. So they understand the, the needs of displaced people and refugees better than any of us could uh, because they work with them directly. And also when it comes to deployment of the solution, uh, working with the Kenya Red Cross means that there's a level of separation between faceless hackers and the actual refugees or displaced people in the sense that they know that the solution is, uh, it comes from the Kenya Red Cross rather than um, you know, an entity known as faceless hackers going directly to the refugee camps. And so in that sense, we've been able to, to see the uptake of the solution being very, it's, it's been good uh, during the pilot phase. And this is because um, when we began deployment of the solution, the community health volunteers who are already known to the uh, refugees and displaced people were the ones who are going directly to them and using the solution with them to log their health complaints. And also it's backed by the Kenya Red Cross. So the Kenya Red Cross are the ones that are using the data. So in, in, in that sense, um, that, that uh, relationship of trust has been able to, we've been able to uphold it because um, we, are coming in as a technolo technology enabler, but in the, 
in the most so social sense with interactions with the displaced people, it is still being managed uh, from the Kenya Red Cross side. So we're coming in as, as an enabler rather than um, us going to you know, the refugee camps or to the settlement to try and you know, take the solution there directly out uh, as, as faceless hackers. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I'd say. Thank you for letting me say up. this. Um, sorry, please, Matthew. I say, well, there's some really interesting points. I see all the time on the data hub, and uh, by the way, Ahmad also works very intensively on the data hub and organised some live sessions in Jordan too. So it's very busy. Um, but I would say some interesting points about trust and transparency there. Um, what Nile's doing is very important, I think, in terms of delivering really relevant information. That you know, as we all know, it's hard enough for everyone to to come through Google to find something to buy let alone being a displaced person or a refugee in, in a new country and not having the language. It's very good to be able to get the kind of relevant information. That establishes trust right away. And Philomena talking about partnering with Red Cross, so, you know, an incumbent organization, if you will, but one that already has trust and can guide you through. Really important, I think. And it helps, you know, trust now, I think, is transparency. So it's really clear for refugees, displaced people to see uh, where the information is coming from. They can trust it and also who they're partnering with. Um, so yes, trust and transparency, really important. As you can see, it goes from a really super modern perspective to also very traditional orgs like Red Cross. Absolutely. Well, great. Um, we're almost running out of time. I just wanted to ask maybe one question, even ask uh, the audience if there's any questions from the audience. We'd love to have any, any questions coming through. Um, one particular question I have is, is around data being closed and open, right? So obviously with health data, there are mm -hmm. sensitive data that, that are closed which for natural reasons, and then the importance of maintaining trust. Uh, but I actually wanted to talk to, to Matthew and Ahmed, since you're both working on the Data Hub, um, the importance of open data. Um, do you, how do you see that, that playing a role in, in, in enabling sort of inclusion aspects of displaced people through the initiatives that you're working with Data Hub? Could you share any insights? Well, very quickly, I would say that open data, it's important to be in an open data ecosystem, right? So obviously around me medical data needs to be very deeply anonymized because metadata can give you away and can be very, obviously it's very perilous to have medical data out there. So the more open data there is around you, the more freely you can move, I would say, and, and, and the more... Um, you can be open with your data or anonymize it or there's more to go from. So it's more about, I think, big open data field around you. We see it in, in every aspect of uh, the data world. Um, so yeah, that's what I think. That, that seems to be a challenge all the time. It's like, uh, how open is the ecosystem around you? Absolutely, great. Ahmed, do you have any final thoughts before I, we, we kind of close out the session? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm a big fan of, of open source and open data so uh, <laughs> my, 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 um, my approach would be uh, open open source technologies and open source solutions uh, like dr x uh, had had uh, shifted into uh, very uh, uh, rapidly uh, after the pandemic i think that uh, open source solutions can help every uh, a lot of initiatives to start from where other people has stopped and uh, I think that helps us to uh, motivi uh, motivate and catalyze uh, the energy that the newcomers have. At the same time, as, as, as Matthew has mentioned, uh, it's, it's very important to, to, uh, uh, to have it in a way that is uh, anonymized, but maybe we, we, we will be facing a new um, data Paris agreement. Uh, very soon, <laughs> in a way uh, that, that can help uh, helps us. Uh, Raj, you, you're an electrical engineer, and you know, like the ITU does in the communication sector, uh, maybe we need something similar to that in the data field that can help uh, big pharma to make use of that data and to help so, the humanity. To, to yeah, that's a very, very good thought. I like that thought, actually. Mm -hmm. So I just have a quick uh, look at through chat. I can't see any questions coming through. I can see the links going through on the faceless uh, hackers initiatives in Kenya. And obviously we've got information on Dr. X. Uh, you know, by all means, audience members, please do engage, do reach out. Uh, we've got amazing individuals on the panels. If you'd love to know more, uh, please do engage with each individuals. Uh, we, you know, they've got the information's in the chat. 
Um, but with that, I wanted to personally thank each everybody, everybody on the panel for hosting and uh, being on the panel for the virtual uh, clap for run. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, thank you, Shukran. <laughs> Shukran. <laughs> thank you very much. Right. Thank you. So we're going to move to the next section of our uh, uh, final section of our presentations. Just bear with you. I'll just go back to screen. So, um, so on this final section, we've got a really interesting uh, presentation that's going to be given by my colleague, Louise uh, Brosse, who's who leads our global community management uh, for Tech Futures. She's got an amazing presentation of, of uh, an online repository that uh, Tech Futures has developed um, of curating, you could say, of all the directories of, of most valuable solutions uh, for displaced people. And with that, she's going to share much more insights around the innovation survey and the call to action. So I'm going to hand over the call now to, to Louise. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and have over to you, Louise. Thank you. Thank you, Raj. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I'll uh, and um, share this uh, exciting news. Um, so as Raj mentioned, I've been working with the, the Tech Bridges community for the past few years and um, supporting the chapters and the teams of volunteers that we have on the ground to be autonomous to organize their activities. Um, and I'd like to start with maybe a reminder um, uh, about why we do what we do uh, and why we started um, to build these communities to support uh, Tech for Refugee Solutions, uh, which is the need of access to internet and the importance of accessing to internet for displaced persons, forcibly displaced persons, uh, most of all, uh, which is um, uh, how to remain connected with the loved ones, how to have access to information, know one's right. Um, and there was this stereotype in the past um, that people on the move did not have access to internet or smartphones. Um, and I wanted to share two figures, which is the first one, 85% of refugees had a smartphone when arriving in Greece in 2015. And the UNHCR assessed that 97% of the displaced persons were living in 2G and 3G covered area. Um, so what um, is important to, to say is that the access to internet is possible and it enables, as we saw in the different panels discussions today, uh, to widen the opportunity and to provide access to what should be public services. Um, and that's what we're trying to do through the digital community and the physical community of TechFugees. Um, so what is exactly uh, a project that is using tech uh, for displaced persons? Um, we assessed with tech refugees over the past five years that there were different areas where technology could play an important role of facilitators and um, uh, access enabler in regards to access to information, uh, access to health, access to education, employment and inclusion. And we focus on those areas to support existing projects um, that we saw as well today, like Dr. Stila or Dr. X, Faceless Hackers, and so much more. Um, but what we saw in the past years supporting this project uh, was that there were several common challenges for that the innovators were facing and that displaced persons as uh, users as well were facing. And that's what brought us to build base refugees. So the main challenges were um, we saw uh, over like working in 40 countries that uh, in the hackathon we organized and the Disney sprints we organized, there was a duplication and a multiplication of the projects um, that were not necessarily linked with each other. So we saw the same idea starting in Colombia, starting in Australia and starting in Germany with um, the innovators not having access to the work that was done in the past by others. And we wanted to put and create link in between the different innovators. Um, we, the technologists were also facing problems. So uh, how to choose the persons to work with and how to get access to a pool of volunteers uh, to support the effort because we, so as Ahmed, um, our keynote speaker today mentioned um, that uh, often entrepreneurs start with very limited um, resources and um, having the support of skilled entrepreneurs from the tech sector 
and uh, from the humanitarian sector really helps designing relevant solutions that can be used and have an impact on the ground. And uh, last and the most important um, one is um, we had a lot of feedback from these police persons saying that they didn't know which apps or tech to trust and that there had been so many um, a big trend and an explosion of uh, solutions to, to support um, that uh, it was hard to know which one to choose and how to access this information. So we've built base refugees, which I'm going to make a, a very first demo of today, um, which is a web-based platform, meaning mobile friendly as well, that curates um, the product that we've been working on and supporting with the tech refugees community and that are um, targeting and serving um, to empower displaced populations worldwide. So the goals of this platform are, I'm going to name three main goals, which are to answer the challenge that I've just mentioned. The first one is to bring people together. So create collective innovation and start uh, sharing mistakes or failures or best practices among the innovators working in the same field. So as Harold mentioned uh, in the previous panel discussion, for instance, and there is a lot of discussion uh, that are needed regarding financial inclusion and how to collaborate to build technologies that can be scalable as well. Um, the first, uh, the second goal is um, we are contacted by a lot of volunteers and a lot of people who want to help but don't know how. Um, so Base Ridges is going to be the go-to place for volunteers who want to support with the tech skills or marketing skills or uh, humanitarian knowledge, those projects to uh, grow and get sustainable. And um, we act as well as uh, the trust third party to evaluate which are the, the uh, technologies that are useful and that are having an impact with our network of partners on the ground. So what are the kinds of projects um, that are registered on base refugees? Um, I think the three main criteria that we use to select the projects are um, the value proposition and the target uh, of the project. So project working in information, health, employment, education, and social inclusion. Um, the stage of the project, because we want to showcase ready to use proven solutions, so which are available on the markets. And we're always glad to support like products that are at the ideation phase or MVP stage, but uh, um, uh, the ones in base switches are ready to scale and already have users. And um, last but not least, we um, select a project as well that validate uh, and abide by our values and guiding principles which um, we discussed a little bit today, but uh, which I'm going to remind as well. Um, so over the past years, and uh, uh, Mike Butcher, uh, as uh, during the welcoming address reminded it, um, we've gathered guiding principles, uh, which are lessons and advice for the innovators who are starting or working in the tech field to support displaced persons. Um, the first one being human-centered design and working with displaced persons, so involving displaced persons at every step of the process and not considering them, as Harold mentioned, as beneficiaries, but being part of the innovation. Um, the second one is about empowerment, so not thinking that people are going to use uh, your solution just because it's technical, there needs to be an added value that make the user more independent. Um, there's a big part about data and data privacy, especially when working with persons who can be in a vulnerable situation. So don't collect the data just because you can make it. Um, you need to be transparent and understand uh, what is really needed for your project to work and protect the persons that you're working with. We value a lot collaboration, as you might have understood, and promote open source because we think that by building together, we build things that are stronger. Um, because we're all in this together is the part of building inclusive technology. So um, our work um, with TURN and with TechFridges is to work with displaced persons, but the product that are being built are not necessarily 
only useful for displaced persons when we're talking about financial inclusion, when we're talking about knowing one's right, um, it is available for anyone. And um, we want to build this to be available for as many persons as possible. Um, oh, good intentions are great to start, but sustainability is the real impact. And that is an important point as well. Um, as I was mentioning, like we have seen like an explosion of um, tech for good products and services, um, and especially some targeting displaced persons. Um, but sometimes uh, the entrepreneurial journey stops and uh, we've seen a lot of project not um, updating the informations or um, who can uh, not consciously create um, distrust towards technical projects and digital tools. Um, so thinking long-term and being um, responsible for the inf information that is public and available for the persons you're trying to serve is really important. And we can stress that enough. Um, knowing the rights and uh, the international laws uh, get around forced migration is important as well when you're going into this field. And I'll stop with the last one, which is um, um, tech is just a tool. So it's neutral. Uh, it's not the objective in itself, but it's just an enabler to uh, open to opportunities or um, provide a service, but it's neutral and it can be used in a good or bad way. So what you will get on base refugees? Uh, why should you register on the platform? Um, so we are using this platform to provide innovators and projects with the four um, main categories of support. The first one is networking with similar entrepreneurs and similar projects. Um, the second one is volunteering. So um, we are using the platform to redirect different volunteering opportunities and create this community of open knowledge and collaboration. The third one is partners. So we're working with different kinds of partner, which can be content partners, such as um, the work we do with Befollow Grade. Um, deployment partners or so NGOs on the ground at grassroots associations, um, financial partners or funding opportunities that we can share. Um, and the fourth category of support is visibility. So uh, we really value the fact of bringing visibility to um, the innovations that are impactful on the ground and that are not necessarily known by lack of means and lack of um, influence on social media or network. And that's a role that we want to help uh, with base refugees. Um, I'm now going to make a demo about the platform. Um, so when you arrive on base refugees, base refugees uh, which is our product, which is live today, um, you can sign up, uh, but as I'm already signed up, I'm going to sign in. And when you arrive on the platform, you'll see um, all the available innovations and projects that registered on the platform, uh, some news, and I'm going to take, for instance, the follow grade with Vanessa here in the previous panel discussion. So a description of uh, what the project uh, is providing. So here, access to offline digital services, some photos to explain what the project is um, and what the hubs here are a video of presentation and you have to contact form a member of the team. What is important as well is uh, the refugee-led organization, which is uh, respect to our guiding principle uh, with uh, the human-centered design. You see the stage of development, the types of for-profit, non-profit, the vertical on which the project is active and the support that is needed. Then you can send a message directly to the innovator if you're a volunteer, if you're interested, if you are seeking for more information. All the projects are here. You can filter by stage, by vertical, by support needed. You have also some organizations that are registered that are supporting innovators and displaced persons directly. And um, 
you can find a lot of different projects from different places as well um, from the five continents. So I'm really pleased um, to, to, to introduce you to this project um, and platform. And in order to record and register your project, you just have to create your profile and post a project that will be vetted by um, the TechFugis team. Um, the process is quite intuitive. Uh, if you have some feedback to share, don't hesitate. And I'll move back to my last um, call to action. You receive um, uh, in the chat, uh, in this uh, discussion, but also um, in the next few days, we'll be posting about it, an innovation survey, um, which is directed to tarot entrepreneurs and other entrepreneurs that are working in the digital field to support displaced persons. Um, and if you're interested in being part of base refugees and being uh, part of the tech refugees community as well, um, we invite you to fill out this survey and through the partnership that we um, announced as well with a turn, uh, we would be more than delighted to redirect some of the entrepreneurs that are seeking for incubation as well who are based in the UK or in the countries where turn is going to expand um, to get supported and sustain their project. Thank you very much for listening. And um, I'll give back the floor to Raj to conclude. Thank you, Louise. Um, great stuff, thank you. So let me just present the final slide and then we'll, I'm gonna ask all the panelists and speakers to join me on the stage in a minute after this slide. So you'll have your cameras on. So obviously we thank you so much or everybody in the audience for joining us today. It's been a, an amazing event and hopefully you've, you've learned a lot as much as I have in hearing all the stories um, of tech fugies and some of the initiatives that we're working in terms of innovations that are being worked with displaced people and with refugees around the, around the globe. If you are curious to know more, uh, please do link up, network. I mean, this is all of your very much a people-centric organization and I, you know, do reach out to TURN and tech fugies. Uh, we do have a LinkedIn event page and you'll see that link here in the slide. Uh, connect with us, leave comments, Feel free to reach out to us, and but do look out for a follow-up email on next week, and we'll, we you can watch the recordings and and do connect with us. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, as a final uh, say to thanks to all the speakers. I'd like everybody to uh, come on the stage with me, and we'll do a gallery view for the audience. <laughs> so let's do that. <laughs> so hopefully this technology works. So uh, first of all, thank you so much to all the speakers and the people on working behind the scenes, particularly Petra has been absolutely amazing doing the great job in terms of the Zoom handling and everything else. Uh, and of course, our, our partners turn and all our partners together uh, and our sponsors in, indeed. Uh, we hope you've all enjoyed a great day. Reach out, connect with us, and we look forward to seeing you very soon. And have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.